I live in New South Wales, Australia. This encounter took place in October of 2014 when I was 12 years old, and it was my last year of primary school. We went to the school camp that year, and we would spend two days down at the Mogo Gold Run Colony, an old preserved gold rush colony from the times of the gold rush in Australia, since at the time we were learning about British colonization and our early history. It's located a few miles south of Batemans Bay, and it's surrounded by the bush. The bus ride was fun, but taxing since we lived in Wollongong, which is nearly three hours away from Batemans Bay. We finally arrived late in the afternoon and were sorted into our cabins. My friend and I were put in the cabins closest to the tree line, which was also closest to the bridge leaving the living quarters. My friends and I packed our PSPs, board games, and my friend David even brought his small pinball machine. We were also completely packed up on sweets and snacks. We were planning to stay up long into the night having fun. After dinner that night, we were made to sit with our formal partner and listen to the local aboriginal elder named Sam. Sam talked about a lot of things. He went into great depth about the British impact on the aboriginals, talked about the troubles they brought along with them, and eventually asked if we liked scary stories. Everyone excitedly said yes. Sam told us that the aborigines had many creatures from their stories they believed in, like the Bunyip and the Yowie. His face eventually grew dark and grim before saying the British also brought their own monsters with them. He mentioned one beast in particular that all of us kids recognized. The European werewolf. One boy laughed and said werewolves weren't real. They're just old myths made up by movie makers. That old man looked over to that boy and said, Well, I pray you never meet one yourself then. And as cliche and silly as he sounded, he looked dead serious, even concerned which only made me feel a little more unsettled. We were then told to go back to our cabins to unwind, and it took many of the rowdier cabins a few hours to do that, but soon it was just us. One of the teachers had come down because Liam had broken a light bulb by accident, so she had to take him back to stay with the teachers because the assistant principal had also gone with us, so she had to follow the school's protocol. That only left Cohen, Brody, Lachlan, David, and myself in the cabin. Lachlan had been hit by an extreme homesickness now, so Brody, being the fair dinkum he was, kept him company, comforting him and telling him that it's all going to be alright. We're going to have a great time. We all had a set of double bunk beds lining the cabin up to the bathroom at the back. It was like a flat almost. It was quite cozy. It was like a double cabin. There was another group that had one next door to us. The cabin only had two windows. One in between my bunk in the bunk that Lachlan and Brody were sharing. The other was above the toilet. It had a shutter that we kept open for light from the outside. At around 1 a.m., it began pelting down rain. Lachlan was still crying, David was playing his PSP with his headphones on, and Cohen and I were talking. I had the urge to go to the bathroom, and as I stood up there doing my business, I suddenly heard Lachlan screaming that something was standing at the window. I glanced out the window to the side of the cabin, and I see it this huge black figure covered in fur. It appeared to be squatting on two legs, which were bent back like the Hollywood werewolf. Its arms were down to its knees, with long bony fingers that ended in claws, the length of steel nails. It had a semi-muscular body, and the head of a dog, but there was something wrong with it. Its muzzle was more like a wolf's, and its ears were smaller. It had a shaggy mane, and a wet black nose that dripped from the downpour outside. It had placed one of its hands on the window, looking inside at the kids. With its other hand, it scraped down the glass with a claw, as if measuring how thick it was. Its face was mischievous, intelligent, like it enjoyed the fear that it was giving Lachlan. I began to slowly close the shutter to the bathroom window, not taking my eyes off of this beast. However, the blinds made a loud squeak, and as soon as I started, the beast turned instantly to face me. I wish I hadn't done that, because that beast stared at me, and that was when I got a good look at its face. I tremble every time I think of that face. Words fail to describe exactly what I saw, but I'll do my best. Its eyes were like a bright amber that seemed to glow like the embers of a fire. It slowly began to bear these sharp teeth at me, with this sinister looking snarl. I saw a mixture of saliva and rain dripping from its exposed mouth. It loud out a low growl, so deep I could feel it vibrating my chest. 
I was completely frozen in fear at this point, and I could feel myself lost in this thing's eyes. Its gaze was one of hatred and rage, but I also felt it had this sense of curiosity to it. I wanted to see what it was going to do next, given that if it meant trying to attack me, I could run, or at least try to hide somewhere. And then it began to run its razor-sharp claws down the side of the wooden wall on the cabin. All the while, it didn't break eye contact with me, and I couldn't turn away from it. I could see the black claws glistening in the rain from the light of the gazebo. Then I saw a flashlight bobbing behind it. It was the teachers. They must have heard Lachlan screaming because all of them came running down the trail. The beast then glared angrily in their direction before giving me one last look. It got down on all fours and began to take off at this alarming speed, kicking up bark chips everywhere as it ran. I glanced to the window it was at before and watched this beast bound towards the colony and over the bridge. All the while, it kicked up that dirt and grass. David had still been playing his PSP with his headphones in and didn't see or hear any of this, and Brody had stayed on the bottom bunk, which he chose to stay on because Cohen stayed in his. Lachlan was now sobbing hysterically at this point. The teachers unlocked the door and burst inside. Lachlan kept on repeating that there was a monster at the window, but our teacher, Miss Chapman, didn't believe him. She turned to me and asked, Did you see a monster? I pointed at the scratches on the window without saying a word and moved past her to climb onto my bunk. She looked at them and then simply said that she would find the little troublemaker who did this. To which I replied, Good luck. I hope you know how to deal with a werewolf. She clearly didn't see the size or width of the scratches, or she refused to buy it or something like that. In Australia, we don't have big cats or bears, so I guess to her it was nothing. For hours, I laid there wondering if it was going to come back, wondering what it wanted to do. I closed the shutter to the window above my bed, and soon I must have fallen asleep. I woke up last that morning. Lachlan, Brody, and Cohen were quiet. We didn't speak a word until we got changed for the day. That day, we were taken on a tour of one of the mines that had been restored, and David and I decided to slip off from the group to explore the colony on our own. As we wandered through the town, I couldn't really help but wonder why there were claw marks on some of the walls of these old buildings. Immediately, I thought of that creature the night before, and it sent chills down my spine. I knew what did it. I know what I saw that previous night. We decided to check out the back of the barber shop, which was immediately backed by this thick forest, and there we were hit by this foul odor. David said we should follow it and find out what it was. This sounded like a terrible idea, I know, but I gave in to peer pressure, what can I say? I was curious to see if we would run into this hairy friend of ours again. I guess I was just too young and stupid to realize how awful of an idea it could have been running into that creature. I mean, I saw how dangerous it was that night, but I guess my curiosity just got the better of me. What we saw, though, made me throw up. In a clearing, not too far from the barber's back lot, was this mangled mess of what looked like it used to be a kangaroo. There were parts of it scattered all over the ground, and the forest at the base of this large gum tree. It looked like something much bigger than it had slammed it against the tree repeatedly. I heard David's breath catch as he asked what could have done this. I urged him that we should leave, and thankfully, after seeing that mangled carcass, he agreed. We ended up rejoining the group, who were down at the road at the blacksmith. I did take the chance to tell him what we saw the previous night, since he had missed it. I told him how Liam used to own a book called Werewolves, Vampires, and Zombies, which contained a section on cryptids, and in particular, I told him about the Beast of Bray Road and how it looked similar to the drawing in that book. He wasn't skeptical at all given the slaughtered kangaroo we found, and soon the guide led us into the barber shop with the class, and not long after that everyone began complaining about the smell. So the guide discovered the handiwork of the beast for himself, and then told us we had to go back to the old school. A little later, while all of us kids were safe at the schoolhouse, I saw a few of the workers meet up with the guide to help. They looked like what they were discussing was something important like what to do with this situation and then they disappeared I'm guessing to clean up that monster's mess 
During lunch, David and I went to explore the caravan park, stumbling upon the largest gaggle of geese we'd ever seen. These geese were vicious though, and they roamed the whole property. After that night of formal dance practice, we returned to the cabin to unwind for bed. Before it got dark, I closed the outside shutters on the window and we locked everything down. We even shut the blinds for good measure. I locked the doors and withheld from Lachlan that we barricaded the door with the wardrobe. Liam didn't understand why we were doing all of this and asked what on earth was going on. I simply told him the lock was busted and we all fell asleep that night fairly fast to the sounds of the cicadas and crickets. But I was slowly awakened around four by this subtle bump. The sounds of the night had ceased and not even the early birds were making any noise. Let me tell you, when it gets that quiet, it's eerie. But then soon after that, that thumping continued and soon it sounded like this screeching of steel as something began to claw the metal around the building. There wasn't a lot of that, so it had been going out of its way to do this. And I think it was a scare tactic. I knew immediately that the beast was back. I was beginning to shake and feel nauseous, thinking that this thing could easily smash its way inside. And then I started to wonder if it was watching us that day as we explored. I closed my eyes, beginning to pray, reciting the Lord's words and asked for aid. And soon I could hear it growling at something. Then the scratching and thumping ceased. I could hear the distinctive sound of geese, followed by a deafening roar that shook the building. Then there was the sound of fluttering and honking. It sounded like hundreds of them. Then there was another roar that seemed almost annoyed. It growled and snarled and then walked away into the bush. The sounds of the geese continued and seemed to follow it and soon everything went quiet again and the sounds of the night returned. By then everyone was awake and Liam was begging to know what the hell was going on. I told him I wasn't sure. After unlocking everything at 5.30 a.m. and unbarricading the door, Lachlan and I decided to examine the outside of the cabin. Man, what a mess. Claw marks down the shutter, indentations in the wood from the pounding and pounding, bark chips everywhere, feathers scattered about, and a few dead geese. We removed the dead birds. We knew we'd be questioned about the damage and the dead geese wouldn't help. So we dumped them in the creek, separating the cabins from the colony, and then we began to pack our things. Later that morning, we stopped at the Mogo Zoo, and shortly after that, we were on our way home. We didn't talk about anything on the bus ride. The past two nights had been very traumatic for us, and Liam and Brody were still skeptical, even though the evidence of the creature was right there, and it was clear in their faces. A few months after that, I started high school. During that time, I became obsessed with Skyrim, and when I did the quest where you could become a werewolf, I was instantly hit with a wave of nauseousness. It was uncanny how similar the werewolf in that game and the beast we saw a few months back were. The only person I ever told about this was my dad, and with a frightened expression, he quickly believed me and told me his own story which happened about 30 minutes south of the Gold Rush colony. He was sleeping in a granny flat under the house that could only be accessed from the outside. He and his brother woke up to what sounded like the tapping of steel on the glass. They looked and saw a beast with the head and face of a dog. It looked like it was trying to peek in and he swears it had a grin on its face, just like what I saw. To this day, I wonder what would have happened to us if we hadn't been separated by a wall from that terrifying monster who turned animals outside into pulp. One more thing I think about regularly is that Sam, the aboriginal guide, seemed to know a lot about werewolves. Of all the creatures that he talked about, he could have described any other one in such detail that night, but he chose the werewolf, a creature that wasn't even part of the lore that he was telling us, a creature that he himself had been brought over to Australia from settlers from Britain. I don't really think it was a coincidence that we happened upon something that looks remarkably like a werewolf, especially on the very same night that he was talking about it. Sometimes I wonder if he knew more than he was letting on, or maybe Sam and the thing we saw those two nights were one and the same. Maybe he was the wolf the entire time. What do you think?
Bear with me. This happened a long time ago, so the specifics of when and where have escaped me, but the rest of what I saw is something I can never, ever forget, even 30 some odd years down the line. For the longest time, I had no idea or words for this thing other than a werewolf, even though it was in the middle of the day. For years, I only told a couple of people because I lived in fear of people thinking that I was some kind of kook. I told my friend about it, who I think that thing was chasing when all of this went down. He didn't believe me. He thought it had to be something else. Anything else, really. Because werewolves don't exist, right? Well, my friend, if this makes it to your channel and there's anyone that agrees that they don't exist, they're wrong. I saw one. I know what I saw. And I know it wasn't anything else but a werewolf, or something very similar in appearance. I'll set the stage for you, as best as I can remember. I'd call on my friend Billy, who was in the other car at the time, but sadly he passed away about a year ago. So this entire account is what I witnessed. My mind isn't what it used to be either. Maybe I remember the encounter so vividly that I can remember it, but I don't know. It seems maybe some of the insignificant parts are the parts that I pushed out of my mind. I think it was 1983. I know it was summertime, August if I'm not mistaken. So that would make me about 25 years old, if that's the right year. I know it was before either of us met our ladies, so everything before that's kind of hard to keep track of. It happened in Ohio, but for the life of me I can't remember which part. I wasn't from that area. We were just passing through on our way to a weekend show for classic cars that my cousin Jim had told me about. He knew the two of us were very proud of our rides, and we figured we'd jump to the chance to show them off. Plus, I hadn't been to visit in a good long while, so we packed for the adventure and set out for a good time. We both lived in Kendallville, Indiana, and we were driving to Pittsburgh for the show, so it was going to be a long drive, but the both of us were up for the road trip. I just wish we hadn't picked that damn road to drive down, because all of this happened right then and there. Still, it opened my eyes to what could really be out there, and we both made it out alive, so I guess it could be worse, right? I was driving my 1953 Chevy Bel Air. That I remember clearly. Boy, she was a beauty. Billy was driving his 1965 F100, and he was in front of me. Wherever we were, looked just like a back road that takes you away from civilization. One of those roads where you only see the other cars every so often. We hadn't seen another soul for miles, and honestly I was getting a little bit bored. We still had a few hours worth of driving to get to the show, and Billy was just cruising along, going slower than I would like. If I was in front, I'd be going faster than he'd like, so he insisted that he take the lead. And since I was in my cherry ride, I didn't care. I just wanted to hear that motor purr and drive down to where we were headed. We were in the middle of a cornfield, apparently. I remember cornfields on both sides. Very Texas chainsaw, if you get my drift. I didn't ever get out to see clearly, but the corn itself looked taller than me, and I come in at six foot one. So I'd put that corn at about seven feet tall or so. Who knows, might even be taller. They all just kind of looked the same as you were zooming by. That's what I was bored for, you see. Nothing but corn, as far as the eye could see. I think I was even zoning out just focusing on the road lines. Then out of the blue, I realized that something was running through the corn. It was between Billy and myself, like it was chasing after him or something. I was intrigued. You see, it looked like a big, upright creature, so I knew it wasn't some kind of animal, because there wasn't anything that could run on two feet like that. I wasn't even sure there was any kind of animal in Ohio that could match that description, to be honest. We were from Indiana, just passing through, so the local wildlife was something that was beyond my knowledge. So I just watched what I thought was a very large man chasing after Billy's truck. Now keep in mind, this thing was still in the corn all the while, so at this point, seeing all the details was hard to do. I thought to myself, damn, that guy's fast. We're going about 40 or so, 
And like I said, Billy was going slower than I'd like. Still though, you show me any man that could keep pace at 40 miles an hour. That's just not going to happen. There wasn't anything else to do but watch the situation unfold, so I just drove along, keeping an eye on the road and the other on my mystery creature. The more I watched though, the more unnerved I started to feel, until this stone cold dread came over my whole body. I started to get peaks of what I was thinking this thing looked like, and I damn near shit myself as I started putting together all the details that I was seeing. Like I said, the initial belief that I had was that I was staring at some kind of werewolf. This creature was too big and too damn fast to be a person. I realized I could see the top of its head bobbing through the top of the corn every now and then too. That would put this damn thing at seven feet tall at the very least. I tried to keep pace with this thing as best as I could without tailgating Billy. I was afraid if I did that he'd pull over and ask me what my problem was and stopping right now in the middle of nowhere with some kind of beast on our tail was the last thing that I wanted to do. I kept looking over getting as much detail as I could. And here's what I remember. It looked like a damn wolf running on two legs. It was covered in dark hair. I'm not sure if this hair was black or brown or if the shadows of the corn made it seem darker, but I know it was covered in hair from the top of its head to its feet. I know it had a canine muzzle. I could see it as it passed through the corn. It moved its arms back and forth like a man would as he ran, bent at the elbows. The strides that this thing took were incredible. It was sprinting at 40 miles per hour and it made it look easy. It was also very large, as in muscular. Even in the corn stalks I could appreciate that. With your series of questions you sent me, you asked for details like the eye color and the ear shape and if it had a tail or not, but I can't answer those for you my friend. The corn made a lot of details obscured. At one point I believe it looked over at me, like it was curious or maybe even sizing me up to chase me instead of Billy. I just know that at that point where I could feel it looked at me, it looked directly at me and that's when I started to panic. I started to get a feeling that if we didn't get out of there fast, our lives might be in danger. This thing gave the overall impression of being completely lethal. It was for sure an apex predator. I remember wondering where it came from and how it could be stopped if it attacked. I needed to get us out of there because as far as I knew, Billy wasn't even aware that this thing was by us. I guess when they say ignorance is bliss, they are only half right. If I honked, he might stop, thinking that something was wrong with my Chevy. If we stopped, I was sure that this thing would kill us both. At this point, it had been over two miles that it maintained this chase. As far as I know, nothing else can do that at that speed for that amount of time. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. I was already convinced it was a werewolf. I wasn't going to do anything that might cause us to die at the hands of it. I could still see it keeping up with us, not giving any indication of getting tired. I kind of stopped paying attention to it. I was more focused on how to get us out of there. But I did keep a glance over at it every now and then, and it stayed pace with us the whole time. Then I finally figured out what I could do to get him moving. I made sure that nobody else was around, especially in oncoming traffic. That was the nice thing about the road that we were on, you see. You could see for what felt like miles in both directions. When I was sure nobody was coming down the road, I swerved over and sped up, pulling up to Billy's window. I started waving frantically and motioning for him to get going. I was trying my best to make sure he knew how important it was to speed up. And lucky for me, he got the idea and sped his truck up. I slowed and went back to driving behind him. For a minute I thought this thing was going to keep up with us because as we increased our speed, so did it. But I guess it was too much for it because it started slowing down and went further into the corn and then I lost sight of it and floored the gas to get the hell out of there. We drove for another good while before we pulled off and back into civilization. I told him everything I saw and he asked if I was token in the Chevy. I said no man, I wasn't toking anything, you know I don't token cruise. I told him I wasn't stoned and I hadn't been stoned for about a week. Of course I did bring my stash with me but that was for Pittsburgh and that's a completely different story. 
I want to stress to you that I was completely sober during this whole damn encounter. I talked to him about it for years and years, always telling him exactly what I saw. But I don't know if he ever really believed me. He used to joke about it with me, though. He never came out right and told me that he didn't believe me. I guess I'll never know now. Over the years, I started telling more and more people. I didn't really have anything to lose. It happened a long time ago. I just wish I could remember exactly where it was so I could give you guys the location. When I had my encounter with the beast, it was a different time. You didn't have the internet at your disposal, so you couldn't just hop on Google and type in, did I just see a werewolf? The only research you could do is if you went to the library and spent hours reading through dusty books or flipping through old newspaper articles. It was the late 70s. Jimmy Carter was president. The world was a lot simpler and a hell of a lot less scary than it is today. Well, until you see what we did. My family lived on a ranch out in the middle of God's nowhere. For privacy's sake to the people that own the land now, I won't give the exact whereabouts, but we were about 45 minutes from Battle Creek, Michigan. It was myself, my parents, my little brother, my grandparents, who owned the ranch, and my Uncle Paul. Uncle Paul didn't have a family of his own, but he treated me and my brother Randy like we were his own kids. He was my favorite uncle. He was the one that did most of the work around the ranch, so he was constantly outside working on this or that. He was also the one that saw the dog man first. All of us, minus Uncle Paul, were just sitting down for dinner when he came bursting in the front door. I remember the screen door slamming against the wall and all of us jumping, startled by his response to whatever he saw outside. He looked at us, wide-eyed, and said, there's a giant wolf outside, right outside the trees. He ran to his room at the back of the house to get his gun, and my dad followed him. Are you going to shoot it? Randy asked with a little too much excitement. And Grandpa vetoed that idea quickly. No, he's not, he said sternly. Paul came back into the room, loading his rifle, and told us that he was just going to scare it off. We all followed, eager to see his giant wolf. Paul shot the rifle into the air and started yelling at the wolf before I was even out there. When I made it to the porch, sure enough, there was this huge black wolf sitting on the edge of our property. Uncle Paul wasn't lying. He was the biggest wolf I'd ever seen, still to this day. Paul took another shot towards the wolf and it got up, turned around towards the woods as casual as if he was just strolling around, and headed off into the trees. Before he went into the woods though, he turned and looked at us, and I swear to you, as I am typing this now, this thing looked like it was angry with us, downright pissed off even. It bared its teeth at us and trotted into the forest. My mom grabbed me and Randy and ushered us into the house. We had to promise not to go outside by ourselves for the time being, and as much as it made me sad, I promised not to go outside. At the time, I was 13, and Randy was 10. Telling us to stay inside was like giving us a prison sentence. That night, we heard the strangest, most terrifying noises that I could ever imagine, and can barely even describe. They sounded like a man screaming in anger, mixed with some kind of animal howling. I ended up sleeping on the floor of my parents' room while Randy bunked up with Uncle Paul. Those noises were just so scary to us young kids. We also heard the sound of some kind of animal, and it sounded like it was being mauled to death. It was screaming in fright and agony. I was terrified. I didn't know what was going on outside. The next day, after quite a search, my dad and Uncle Paul found one of our neighbor's sheep that had been torn to bits and eaten by something big. When they talked to our neighbor, they said they too had seen that big black wolf the day before and shot at it. If my parents were serious about us kids staying indoors before, it might as well have been carved in stone that we were to stay inside after that. The next night was just as scary as the first. 
We heard those howl screams again, but this night, about an hour after that, we heard gunshots too. They were coming from the direction of our neighbor that lost his sheep. Gramps, Dad, and Uncle Paul all went outside with their rifles to see if they could see or find anything, but they didn't go too far because my mom and Grammy were pretty serious about them getting their butts back into the house. I think the two of them would have just dragged them back in if they had to. I didn't get much sleep that night either, and neither did my little brother. We shared my parents' bed with my mom while my dad and Paul stayed downstairs. And I could hear them talking all night long, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. The next day they went over to our neighbor's house, and they were gone for a couple of hours. When they came back, they were quiet, which wasn't normal for either of them. I walked in on all the adults talking, and they stopped when I entered the room. Mom told me to go upstairs and to keep Randy out of trouble. I knew they were talking about something they didn't want me hearing, so I just quietly obliged and went upstairs. Later that day, Grammy pulled me into her room and made me promise not to tell Randy anything that she was about to tell me. She was always a believer that I was older than my years and I could handle adult things. She was also stubborn and queen of that ranch, so if she wanted me to know something, she was going to tell me. She told me that our neighbors, Anne and Jim, saw the wolf on their property again that night. But this time, Jim shot it, right in the chest. But it didn't do a damn thing to it. In fact, they think it just made it mad. And the next part is something I will never ever forget. She leaned into me, and that was the first time I'd ever seen her frightened by anything. What you need to know about Grammy is she was the bravest and strongest woman that I've ever met in my entire life. But she looked scared that day, and I know why. Because what she said to me, they told your daddy and Polly that it got up off of four legs and it ran off on just two. The way she whispered it sent chills down my spine and my eyes teared up in fright. I asked what she thought it was but she told me that she didn't know. For the next three days I was so sick to my stomach by what I learned that I barely ate. Every night was the same. Those god awful screams would pierce the night three or four times in a night. I wanted to leave. I wanted to run away from there and never come back. Gramps, Dad, and Paul would take turns staying up, making sure that nothing came close to our house. I could tell that it was wearing on them too. Because Gramps was always a clean cut, nicely dressed man, but after days and days of keeping watch, his beard started coming in. Something else I'd never seen in the 13 years of my life. And then that night, it came back. All of us heard it when it first arrived, and all of us saw it. The werewolf, the wolfman, the dogman, whatever you want to call it. Something big ran across our porch that night. It sounded heavier than a man, and it sounded like it was on two legs. The footsteps were thunderous, and we could actually hear the wall shaking and the pictures bouncing back and forth on the wall as this thing ran across the porch. Randy and I jumped up from the table that we were at and started to melt down. Grammy and Mom tried to calm us down while the men stood at attention, ready to protect us and drive that thing off. Grammy ushered all of us upstairs. All of us followed without question. She was stern that evening, and even the men were coming along that night. We were up there about ten minutes without incident. Paul was looking out the window when he stepped back and made an audible gasp. It made the room even more silent than it already was. My God in heaven, I remember him whispering. It's out there, and it really is on two legs. Now nothing could stop all of us from looking. Mom wanted me and Randy to stay away from the window, but even my dad told her that we needed to see this. And I could still see that wolf as clear today as I did that night. This thing was only half illuminated by our porch light, but it was enough to give me nightmares for the next decade. It was jet black, and it really, really was standing on two legs. I couldn't see a tail, but the way the legs were bent reminded me of a canine. I could see long arms and what looked to me like actual hands. 
You emailed me and asked me if it had claws on those hands, but I'm sorry. I have no idea. Its head did look like a werewolf, though, I can tell you that. It had an elongated snout and pointed ears. It was wandering around our property like it was looking for something, and I prayed to God that it wasn't looking for us. For all I knew, it was trying to catch our sense or something. Paul wanted to go out and shoot it, but Grammy said it wasn't going to be killed by a rifle. Maybe three of them will do the trick. That's what Gramps said out loud to us. This is our place, and no monster is driving me away from everything that I built, I remember him saying. I remember the anger that was in his voice. It wasn't fear at this point. He wanted to go out there and fight this thing. And my grandpa, let me tell you, if he had to, he would have went out there and bare knuckle boxed this creature to get it off of his property. Because this was the place that he raised his family. And nothing was going to drive him away from that. Even with my grandma telling him to stop, who he usually listened to, he marched right out of the room and down the stairs. Daddy and Uncle Paul followed him. Me and Randy pleaded for them to stop, but my dad turned around, grabbed both of us in a big hug, and told us that everything was going to be fine. What happened next, I only knew through what they told me and by what I heard. Dad told us later that they opened the door and started shooting at that monster and yelling at it the moment the door was open. They were trying to be as intimidating as possible. I heard at least a dozen shots. I heard them yelling and carrying on. I heard that thing hollering back at them. That howl scream and growls and roars. And then I heard silence. I was bawling. Randy was bawling. I thought that it got them and killed them all. I knew that that thing was going to come into the house, march up the stairs and take us next. But then, my dad, Uncle Paul and my grandpa, my heroes, they came back and said it was gone, that they ran it off that night, and then it vanished into the night. Being a 13 year old girl at that point, these three men were my heroes. I looked at them in such a different way after that. Grammy and Mom and Randy and I went to stay with Grammy's sister Wilma for a couple of days after that. Gramps, Dad, and Uncle Paul stayed behind. They'd called the sheriff that night, and when he came over, he was as shocked at what he heard as we were. There were prints all over the ground, made by something that resembled a large wolf. But the way these tracks were... It was like it was only walking on two legs, which made our claims irrefutable to the sheriff, at least in my opinion. I think it also helped that the sheriff was one of my dad's friends, and he knew that my dad and the rest of our family wouldn't make up something like that. They took pictures as proof of what happened. Later, Uncle Paul told me that the sheriff and about a dozen badged men were buzzing around our property and Jim and Ann's property for the next couple of days. Wildlife wardens got involved too, but as far as any of us know, that wolfman was never seen again. I did find out though, that the night Jim shot it, he caught it looking into one of their windows that was about six feet off the ground. I don't know whatever happened to those pictures though. Even though my family was friends with the sheriff, he still had to take them from us. He said he was just doing his job and what he was told to do, and there were no hard feelings. Really, I think they were just trying to cover up what we saw that night. Not our friend, but the people that he worked for. To this day, I can't watch werewolf movies. I can't have my blinds open at night, and I can't listen to stories like this without having nightmares. I'm sure as hell typing all of this up is going to give me one doozy of a nightmare. But I feel it's important to share this, though. Because there's more people out there with these encounters than you think. If my encounter gets even one person to come to terms with what they've seen and come forward, then I will have done my job. That's my story. God bless you, and thank you for sharing it.
I used to work midnights at a gas station a few miles from the Kentucky Dam, which is a few miles from the beginning of the LBL in Grand Rivers. And it was on one of these midnight shifts I had two visitors that would change my outlook on the subject of werewolves and make me a believer in what I had seen myself a few years back in the same area, but had kept it between myself and two other family members that were with me at the time. But that's another story to write down. This story was never in the paper, never on the news. It never had any media attention at all. It was kept hush-hush, and a sacred silence was demanded on all of those involved. It couldn't get out. Ever. It was a few weeks before the beginning of the tourist season, and the tourists were the locals' way of surviving. They were the bread and butter, so to speak. A story like this would be something screaming like shark at the Daytona Beach. The people would stop coming out, just out of fear alone. I wasn't a witness to the fact, just a third person, making an observation and having conversations with two individuals who were a part of the incident who were involved in the whole ordeal. They just came from the crime scene down in the middle of the LBL after being there for over eight hours. It was around three in the morning and they were taking a much needed reality break. There were two officers of the law, two grown men who both appeared shaken beyond description. A mixture of fear and confusion, shock and disbelief emanated from both of them. One was paler than the other. It was like a deathly pale over his skin. And it was this officer, who I'll call Officer Adam to protect their identities, that had to sit on the curb of the gas pumps, head between his legs, and expel the last bit of his stomach contents. The other officer, who I'll call Officer Bill, came in for some coffee for himself and a cup of water for his partner, then rejoined Adam outside. There were no other customers, so I went outside with him to see if I could offer some assistance with the ill man. He gladly took a few Rolades that I had extended in my hand. With his own shaky fingers, he struggled to get them into his mouth. For quite a long while, the only thing that was heard were the crickets in the nearby fields, the sounds of bugs hitting the fluorescent lights above us, hanging from the gas station canopy, and the distant sound of highway traffic that was far and few between as it was the wee hours of the morning. My mind was buzzing with various scenarios. I wanted to know the cause of their distress. Was it a tragic car accident? Possibly a motorcycle wreck? A boating mishap with drowning victims? A murder? A dead body discovered? Curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back. That's why the cat has nine lives. I don't remember sitting down, but after about 15 minutes of this hushed stillness, I found myself beside them both on the curb, staring out into the darkness of the nearby corn pastures and letting my mind paint the pictures of imaginary traumas. Adam spoke first, breaking the silence of obscurity. I can't believe it. It's not possible. I just can't believe it. In a hushed agreement that was almost inaudible, Bill replied, Ah, no. It was... is... it is so unbelievable. I've never seen anything like this before. There was a long pause, a deep breath, and then he continued. I've never even heard of anything like this before. Now I looked at Bill and then at Adam. They were both gazing, open-eyed, unblinking, out into the inky color of the night. Adam's bottom lip was trembling slightly, and I guarantee you, it wasn't from the slight chill of the late spring air. Something, some thing, had filled them with some kind of congested fear. After a few more moments of silent reserve, my patience was rewarded with some slow, fragmented description of their past eight hours. Bill turned his wide, azure blue eyes towards me. They were glazed and bloodshot, tired, frightened eyes. With a weary, shaken voice, he began to unfold the tale that would forever be embedded within my spirit, like a nasty shadow that lingers around the corner waiting to pounce, to awaken your inner fears once again. Why he decided to tell me, of all people, is beyond my comprehension. Maybe it was an avenue he felt safe to travel upon, to get this off of his chest. 
off of his mind. They were both frequent customers, and we knew each other on a first name basis, but to divulge such a torrid account of great magnitude, well, I can only say that the fear inside of them both at that moment in time had to be released. It had to be eased and extracted from their souls, or else they may have gone mad with unbalanced thoughts. Without interrupting, I sat entranced listening to every word, absorbing them like an opiate, a spellbinding narcotic that hypnotized me into forgetting the world even existed for the next half hour or so. This is what they said. They'd gotten a call to help with an investigation at one of the many rural campgrounds down in the LBL. The tourist season was about to start in a few weeks, so as usual there were some early arrivals that had come to claim prime camping spots before the area was overrun with tents and campers and travel trailers. The sun was setting low in the sky when they arrived at the scene. Several other official vehicles were already there. There were many more to come, as they would soon find out. Many coming from other counties, and a few coming from other states. Several of these were coroners from different counties. One coroner vehicle was already present, as well as an ambulance, which would prove useless, as there was no one to save. The victims were all dead. Quite dead. Completely, totally, and thoroughly deceased. A young married couple that had come down to take it easy for a few days. They were the first to discover this ghastly scene. Neither of them wanted to stay behind while the other went for help, so they both nervously traveled to the nearest town, Grand Rivers, and called the authorities. They did not return to the LBL. They merely gave the arriving officer directions to the area of discovery and rented a local hotel room. With the sun going down, it got dark pretty fast, so there was a flurry of floodlights from the cruisers being pointed in all directions, along with the excited movements of $50 flashlights being held by nervous, restless hands searching the trees, the ground, the leaves, the shadows. There was a parked motorhome at the site, its frame being lit by the campfire close by. A fire that had gone almost out on its own, but had been rekindled by the new crowd of men in uniforms so they could have more light and warmth. The front and back doors of the home were open, one of the doors hanging by one hinge in a crooked slant. Through the windows, they could see zigzagged movements of luminosity as the beams from the flashlights searched the interior. Bloody handprints slid down the thin metal wall close to the front door and more bloody hand paintings could be seen along the length towards the back door, their images dancing eerily in the firelight like some ancient tribal symbols. Bill and Adam did not even want to imagine what it was like inside that motorhome, but then again, they'd soon find out that it wasn't what was inside, but what was outside that would change their lives forever. There was already crime scene tape placed in numerous scattered parts of the area, and little white flags on metal stakes stuck into the ground marking evidence. Evidence of ripped clothing, bodies and body parts, separated limbs and piles of bowels, pieces of loose flesh clinging to muscle tissue. What used to be three bodies that just hours before had been a happy family on a happy vacation to create happy memories for years to come. A father, a mother, and a young son. The happiness was gone destroyed by a psychotic madman, or was it mad men? It was a murderous rage that had taken place, one so abhorrently appalling that there were few witnesses to the scene that had kept their composure or held their recently eaten dinners down. At first sight, the victims appeared to be butchered by some unnameable weapon, possibly an ax or a chainsaw, but upon further inspection by the first arriving coroner, the wounds on the bodies were determined to not have been caused by a sharp instrument, but rather some piercing, well-defined claws, the other wounds by some keen, more dauntly long incisors. Was it a wildcat, or a bear, or wolves? The coroner shook his head in a baffled disagreement with the other ones. Guests from each coroner rung out through the night. The officers tried to determine what had happened too, but everybody was dumbfounded. The claw marks, for instance, on the back of the father's corpse were distinctively made by four long claws with a smaller digit, like a thumb on one side. 
The span was wider than the man's print, wider and different than a bear's mark, with deep, deliberate gouges in the flesh. Rake marks from an angry, unknown source trying to grab its prey was no doubt trying to escape. The wildcat, the wolves, those theories were dismissed by the open wound marks that were apparently made by some more grandiose animal source. The bite marks were much larger than any mountain lion or wolf or coyote. Whatever did it had a longer snout and more sizable teeth. There were also indentations and indications in the larger areas of the cadavers, of bite marks where the flesh, meat, and bone had been yanked away from the body, like a human who bites into an apple and leaves the impressions of his teeth and teeth marks, so were the open wounds on the individuals. Bears, well, they aren't native to the area, but who knows? Maybe a grizzly did sneak in some way, but that was far-fetched. He would have had to have traveled several states and crossed several rivers to get close to this part of Kentucky. Everyone present was betting on the bear hypothesis anyway, and no one even thought of anything else to be the cause of such a savage attack. A bear. It had to be a bear. From the back door of the motorhome, an officer stepped down slowly, holding his hands. Inside were some type of garment. It was a dress. A small dress. One that would have had to fit a small girl of around five years old. He informed the onlookers that there were more little girls' clothes packed inside the coach. This meant there was another missing person or an absent body, a member of their family. They all prayed she was still alive, somehow, hiding somewhere, and a new search began. As time went by, additional law enforcement employees arrived, as well as a few volunteer rescue squad members. Groups were spread out in assigned areas to examine and explore. Another coroner arrived to assist in the identification and causes of death, and much later a third one showed, this one from a nearby state. All types of samples were placed in plastic bags, marked as evidence, and carefully stowed away. As they were packing up what appeared to be one of the father's arms, one of the doctors noticed something wrapped between the dead fingers. Some tweezers slowly untangled a long clump of gray and brown hair. This too was placed in a bag, marked and put away to be analyzed at a lab later. From somewhere in the nearby woods, about 50 yards from the campfire, a scream was heard. It was a man's shriek that turned into a long wail, and then to whimpering. As others arrived, they could see by the gleam of several flashlights that the cop was holding his hat in one hand and his light in the other. There was blood on his face, the front of his shirt, and the brim of his hat. More blood could be seen dripping on him. It was coming from above, high in the trees. The flashlights swung, searching for the source of the mysterious bleeding and a very small hand could be seen dangling down from a tree limb way up high, as well as a slender, lifeless leg that still had a white sock on the foot. The missing child had been located. It had been Adam that the blood had trickled on, hitting his hat first, making him look up, and then feeling the thick, cold fluid sprinkling his face, and then sliding down his neatly buttoned shirt. It had been Adam that had screamed, the little girl had apparently been carried up to the tree and leisurely eaten upon while carefully laid across a large tree branch. Most of the same gray and brown hair was found sticking in the bark of the tree nearby. After about seven hours, most of the officers were sent away as a new team of investigators arrived. They were told not to talk to anyone of the incident, especially not the media. I'm sure that besides Adam and Bill, there were others who had to confess what they saw that night, if in fact this whole event ever even really happened. Witnesses that had to divulge the awful secret of the atrocious discovery at one of the campgrounds at the LBL. About a month after sitting outside with Adam and Bill that night, they stopped in again during one of my midnight shifts. They were both rather more serious in nature, not like before the incident. They used to kid around while drinking their sodas and eating a snack or two but now they had both seemed to age in some odd way. Streaks of gray hair that hadn't been there before highlighted both of the heads of hair. Their faces had lines of worry and showed signs of stress. I'd see them again many times afterwards, but on this particular evening, 
They informed me that they got word about some of the lab tests that were taken that dreadful night. The tests on the saliva taken from the bite marks and from the hair found on the man's fingers and in the bark of the tree came back with an unknown species of origin. The closest animal that could be compared to it was that of Canis lupus, a wolf. Whether Adam and Bill had played an elaborate hoax on me, I'll never really know for sure, but the sincerity and the fear painted a picture of truth in their eyes and actions. There were several more stories that I've heard about this werewolf over in the LVL that have been told to me over the years since this particular incident. There were several camp groups of Boy Scouts that had seen it. Several more campers, fishermen, boaters, that had seen it from the safety of their boats, floating in some of the many bays that touched upon the shoreline. Hikers and bikers have heard its howling and have seen something stalking them while they were on the rural trails, hiding amongst the trees. Hunters have come across deer carcasses that have been brutally torn apart. There was even a pair of curious gravestone rubbers who had a fearful encounter with it at one of the old cemeteries. It had actually come up to their car as they were leaving and shook the back end of the vehicle up and down, leaving terrible scratch marks in the trunk lid as it tried to hold on to the little Toyota. The tires were spinning in the wet grass as they tried to get away. These two individuals didn't stop driving until they were about 40 miles away, and only then did they dare to stop to investigate the damage done by the beast. I myself have seen those scratches, much too wide for any man to have made them. They looked like they'd been made by a heavy metal garden rake. But you'll never read about it in the papers, or hear about it on the news, or get a confession from any of the law enforcement officials or man of office. The media will say it's just a bunch of hoo-ha, or just pranks, silly stories, urban legends, or lies. They say they're tall tales. This is tourism country, and that means millions of dollars to the area. So you can't scare off business, can you? To whom it may concern, I am writing this to you because I saw something seven years ago that still haunts me to this day. The only thing I can describe it as is a real physical werewolf. Believe me, I know it sounds crazy, but here on YouTube there are a lot of encounters like this. I am not crazy. I was not and have never been on drugs, and I know what I saw. I never even believed in these type of things before my encounter and it has raised several questions in my faith since then. I'd like to keep this as private as possible, so I'll be changing the names of the people involved and not giving specific locations. Just know, this happened in Ohio, seven years ago, and I was not the only one seeing this thing. For a little bit of a backstory, my friend David and I worked the late shift at a local restaurant, and we typically didn't get out of the building until after midnight. We were both working the bar lately, so getting out early wasn't really a possibility. I was a 24-year-old woman back then, and David was older than me by six months. Neither of us had really been anywhere outside of Ohio. Neither of us had any experience with the supernatural. On the night of our encounter, we were leaving just like normal. The staff was supposed to park around the back of the building in the private parking area, so that's where both of our cars were. We'd gotten to the routine of David walking me to my car since it was late and I'm a girl, so we headed to my car first, which was a few spots down from the garbage area. As we were walking to my car, we started hearing the sounds of something moving in the garbage. It was one of those concrete areas that had several garbages from the restaurant and the other businesses that shared the strip. At first, we thought it was someone throwing garbage away, but it occurred to me that it was actually sounding like someone was moving stuff around inside one of the containers. Maybe it was a homeless person. It's happened before. They're just hungry and looking for something to eat. I thought about slowly going over there and asking if they needed food. I could probably go back and get them something so they didn't have to dig in the trash. Then we heard these weird grunting noises that started coming from the garbage too. They didn't sound human to me. They sounded like a very large animal. So I started thinking it was a bear. Bears can be a problem at this time of the year. 
You don't seem to see them often, but every couple years we have a problem bear around here. Usually it's a young male that ventures into the area and the wildlife officials have to trank them and move them out. Whatever was in there really stank too. It wasn't the trash that I was smelling. I can tell the difference. This smelled like very strong pee and dirty animal. I decided to just walk to my car and get out of there. But David grabbed my arm though and stopped me, giving me a look that meant we needed to be quiet. He started pulling me back towards the restaurant and he had this look on his face like dread. His eyes were huge. Now, I trusted David. I'd known him for years. We went to high school together. I didn't ask questions. I just followed his lead. We didn't turn around to go back. We walked backwards, all the way back to the restaurant around the corner, keeping our eyes on the garbage and those weird grunting noises just kept coming. The digging sound stopped and I half expected a bear to climb over the wall, but what I saw next was something I can never unsee. The door to the garbage area was slightly opened and I saw something peek out of it, slowly and cautiously. It was the muzzle of an animal, but it was too long to be a bear. It looked very canine to me. Then the door pushed open and a second or two later this wolf on two legs walked out of it. And it just stood there on two legs looking around while we hid behind the corner of the building watching this thing. The only thing I could think was a werewolf. I was actually looking at a real werewolf. You asked me for a description, so here it goes. It looked taller than David, but shorter than the garbage area, so I put it around seven feet tall or so. Way too tall to be a person either way. The lighting in the parking lot made the fur seem to be a medium brown, but it also looked like there were different colors mixed in, like gray and black. The arms were skinny, but very long, and it definitely had claws on its hands and fingers, not paws. It looked like a dog reared up on its toes. The legs were skinny and long too and kind of bent at the knee. I've listened to a lot of encounters lately about something called the dog man and how massive they look, but this didn't look like that. It was skinny and almost emaciated. The stomach area was also very sunken in and the head on this thing looked like a werewolf, like some nightmare wolf. It was big and had a long snout. I couldn't see any teeth, even when it growled at us. I think we might have just been too far away for that detail. It had long ears that came off the sides of its head, and they almost looked like how a Doberman Pinscher's ears are after they're cropped. I'm also 100% certain that it had a tail. I saw it when it was running to the fence. This thing reminded me of a German Shepherd's tail, long and bushy. When it was out of the garbage, it looked like it was surveying the area, making sure nobody was there or making sure there wasn't a threat or something like that. I could see its chest going in and out as it was breathing. And then it started to sniff the air, holding its nose up in the air and sniffing around. It started doing this weird heaving thing which sounded like a cross between a laugh and a grunt. It scared the hell out of me. And then I think it smelled us and it was reacting to our scent because it looked in our direction, bared its teeth and started to growl. When it did, I started crying. It didn't come towards us though. Instead, it looked over at this fence that separates our parking lot from an empty field, looked back in our direction and ran to the fence. When it ran, it was still on two legs and the distance between steps was huge. It only took about four or five steps before it got to the fence and leapt completely over it. I mean, this thing cleared that fence with no problem. When it did, it brushed through the trees that are on our side of the fence and I could see the branches moving back and forth and leaves falling off of them. We both ran back to the restaurant, burst back in, and started talking frantically. Luckily, there were still a couple of closers that hadn't finished up yet, so we weren't alone. We were panicked and sweating and shaking because we were so scared and both trying to talk at the same time. We explained what we saw and of course everyone thought it was some kind of prank. But then I started crying again and they started to believe that we'd seen something and they wanted to go out and investigate. I was 100% absolutely against the idea. But David reminded me that all our cars were back there and we would have had to go there eventually anyways. 
It was better to go with a group of people. So we helped finish their side work, and then we all left together. I was trying to tell everyone that this was exactly how scary movies start, but they were more amused and curious to see what was going on. They didn't see what I saw. Maybe if they did, they wouldn't be so damn curious. We ended up staying out there for like 10 minutes or so, but didn't find anything that pointed to a werewolf walking around. The trash was all over the inside of the trash area. It was a horrible mess. A couple of guys, including David, looked over the fence but couldn't see anything. I was sure that thing was going to pop up and rip one of their heads off, and I couldn't believe that David was being so stupid after he saw what I did. But what really freaked us all out and called off this stupid little investigation was the sound of a howl from somewhere past the field. I know it sounds cliche and all, but that really got everyone moving to their cars. After that night, I was scared to walk back to my car and started parking as far away from the garbage as possible. A couple of guys we worked with teased us and kept talking about Helen's werewolf like it was mine or something. I just smiled and kept telling them they wouldn't think it was so funny if they saw what I saw. And you know what? We never saw it again. I stayed at that restaurant for another year and a half before I got a different job. I'm still really good friends with David, and when our families get together for dinners or barbecues, we naturally discuss Helen's werewolf. My husband thinks it's fascinating and always tells David that they should go on some werewolf investigation to see if they can find it. I think it's long gone now. It's been years since this encounter. I don't know if it lived around there or if it just found itself there one night because it was scavenging for food. Like I said, it looked really emaciated and didn't really match up to the big burly types of werewolves or dogmen that I read about or listen to on YouTube. But it's something I'll tell the story of for the rest of my life. My kids aren't old enough to listen to these stories yet because I don't want to freak them out. I mean, they're just little kids and I would hate to give them nightmares. But when they're old enough, I'm definitely going to tell them this story because they should know the truth too. They should know what's out there and they should know that they need to be aware, especially at night, because these creatures really do exist. And I, for one, hope that myself and my babies never encounter anything like that again. Thanks for sharing this. I really enjoy listening to you. Have a good night. Helen.